All right. So we're going to talk about Neil deGrasse Tyson. And uh, the title I have here is The Pandemic of Politics. It's a pretty shitty title, but we'll go with it for now. I'll probably come up with something better, but hey, whatever. So recently, I had the pleasure of seeing Neil deGrasse Tyson at Carnegie Music Hall a couple weeks ago, uh, about a month ago now. Um, I've loved Neil for longer than I can remember, and but but his words on Dr. Carl Sagan is what really made him a mainstay in my little collection of heroes. Um, I had seen some of the original Cosmos, but it was in my younger days when my dad controlled the remote, and it gave me this dreadful feeling of this vast plane that we reside on. And just as fast as it filled me with horror, Dr. Sagan would give your mind whiplash as he then reframed that dreadful feeling as something of beauty. This is the same thing that attracted me to Dr. Tyson's words. Uh, he had that same cutting detail, but phrased just loftily enough to still keep the human spirit entwined within. Now that we've established this is not to deride Dr. Tyson, I want to focus on the ideas that he touched on in his presentation and the crowd's reaction to those ideas. Mostly just the crowd reaction. <clears throat> uh, the title of this presentation was The Cosmic Perspective which sounded exactly what I'm looking for and we need right now. Something to step back and look at the greater space that we observe and try to make sense of it. I have to admit that I've seen uh, Clapback Neil do his things a couple times on Twitter, but uh, I didn't expect to have a tongue bathing about politics for the first half an hour. I can hear him now. It wasn't about politics, it was about the pandemic. And I'll be the first to say, yes, you were right. The problem was the audience reaction to some things Neil was saying. I recall him listing off the statistics of those who had died in their political affiliation. This was something like five times more Republicans than Democrats, and the crowd cheered. Yes, cheered. dumbfounded. Did these people, keep in mind this is Carnegie Music Hall, and I know this is only a museum and not part of the university, but still, I can't imagine too many people, at least not somewhat interested in higher education, attending this event. I mean, come on, it's a lecture from an astrophysicist. Let's be real here. Uh, even if you may consider him more of an entertainer than a scientist nowadays, he is still professionally employed at the Hayden Planetarium as a director and has been their director since 1996, long before he became an entertainer. So he's got the, you know, the credentials. That's the word. <laughs> Cheering for the deaths of our fellow Americans sounds like the start of a plot to an awful anti-hero generic of Joker. Neil did have a somewhat surprised look on his face, but like a true showman, let the applause roll. Which I, you know, that's, that's, you, 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 whatever, he's doing a show, he kind of has to do that. But uh, I kind of mumbled under my mask, which we had to wear, even though pretty much everybody in there was vaccinated. Uh, don't cheer for death. That's what I kind of mumbled to myself is what I was thinking. And I, I mean, I did say it out loud, but like, no one's going to fucking hear you. But obviously it was just for me, maybe a few people around me that weren't cheering and seemed to share the same sentiment. Roughly estimate, I'd say 75%, but certainly over half the room was cheering, yelling and applauding like they made a last minute bet on a horse that came from behind to win. The mood certainly changed for me and it wasn't the performer, it was the audience. And that's what I wanna focus on here. So the presentation kept going on, maybe uh, another half an hour into the presentation. Uh, one of these young lads that was sitting close to us um, in the rafter section, because, you know, can't afford them, them nice bottom seats. Uh, this kid, he had on sunglasses the, the entire time, was kind of interesting, but up until they lowered the lights, I guess, and then he took them off. But he blurted out, Science doesn't care about your feelings. Neil stopped, 
Good, good on you, Neil. Turned to the young lad and said, You know, I get credit for that a lot. But that's not actually what I said. I said on Twitter, and the quote was, The good thing about science is that it's true, whether or not you believe in it. And you could hear a pin drop, and that young boy's confidence shriveled up like a little raisin. It was, oh, he just got told off by Neil deGrasse. Oh. This is the framework I saw for a lot of many self-proclaimed atheists. Science is true because it works for them in their head. It's like they got that initial feeling of dread and horror, but never found the beauty in their insignificance. Their insignificance made it so that they could act however they pleased and not fear any repercussions as long as they didn't directly contradict a law of nature. Instead of putting themselves into the bigger picture, they became their own god. And if they could will it, then it should be done. Obviously, I'm not saying there's a complete lack of morals. I mean, I was atheist for some time and still question to this day, but to believe there's nothing out there is just as suffocating to me as Catholic school. This is our problem, me included, very much. We think we know everything and we can make perfect decisions with the information we have at hand. We often leave out much of the details and focus on what resonates with us, whether that be intentional or not. We are constantly trying to claim the unknown territory as known, even at the expense of our own well-being. This is what religion does for some, and more recently, this is what science is doing for others. Having all the answers at the tips of our fingers is the problem. This phrase exactly. Even the internet doesn't have all the answers yet we act like it does. Just because we all have an encyclopedia at our side doesn't mean we know how to use it constructively. The emergence of social media probably had something to do with this, but with Google saying there are 4.66 billion people on the internet, statistically there's bound to be some gabagoons. That's just, that's just how it is. Gabagoons. Uh, yeah, I love that word. And when the goons get a goonin', it's really hard to not jump in and have some fun too, right? It's fun. It's fun to be uh, a little bit of a troll. What, you know? I mean, if it wasn't, then why would people do it? Maybe because they're sad. But we're going to keep that to ourselves. It's more fun to talk shit on someone or laugh at someone else's expense than try to understand why they're acting like a fool and empathize. Yet, if most people were to see the same interactions in the flesh and blood, their blood might curl. Although maybe I shouldn't hold on to that idea much longer because it feels like the barrier between online and IRL is thinning to a wafer. This is where I gave Dr. Tyson the benefit of the doubt because he's much further removed from the internet generation. So he may not feel the same as I do about this closing gap. The point. Yes, there should be a point buried somewhere in here. Give me a minute. Yes. Dr. Sagan, Dr. Sagan's work on the original Cosmos drove me to atheism and then back to some, some sort of agnosticism, all within the span of an episode. Neil's presentation took us so far out of the cosmos, but it felt like he left it up to us to find our way back to Earth. This leaves one with that existential dread if they did not know their way back home. Sure, this is, there's plenty to be afraid of. Making decisions under the pressure of fear isn't how I want to live. This leads to accountability and the lack of it from all of us. Yes, me. I did say us, didn't I? If we're afraid of what will happen, we'll tend to listen to those we trust to help us make those decisions. But what happens if those we trust are suffering from the same ailment? Fear, fear, fear. Finally, you made it this far, didn't learn anything. Humans are closer related to mushrooms than plants. You taught us that. And humans are also closer related to lab mice than any great ape. There you go. He taught us, he taught us both of those. There are other things that he taught us as well. And you know, some, I, I like to think that I knew a lot of what he was saying. Ho, ho, ho. But, uh, you know, those are some two interesting points that he pointed out. Interesting points he pointed. Interesting things that he pointed out to us. My cat's trying to get the room. There. Now I'm an edutainer too. 